I'd like to introduce Carol Vecchio back to our bi-monthly job seeker group. Carol has been providing career consultation specifically to lawyers for the last 30 years, so this is really a specialty of hers. She founded the Centerpoint Institute for Life and Career Renewal back in 1992 and has impacted thousands of participants with her pioneering career development programs. She is a nationally recognized career counselor, earning the National Career Development Association Outstanding Career Practitioner Award in 2010. She is the author of a recently published book, The Time Between Dreams, and she has contributed to numerous articles about job and career transitions. She also hosts her own radio show on career development, Design a Life You Love. Please join me in welcoming Carol. Thank you, Heidi. Hi, everyone. I, I am so pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for allowing me to come back to the bar. I just love being here. And yes, 30 years of working with lawyers. I have loved it, and it's been great. So, And welcome to all the people who are on the web. Um, I, I just have a question before we get started. So, how, how, And I can't see the people on the web, but how many people are going through some kind of transition in their lives? Okay, now, if, if you didn't raise your hand... This is what I like to say. Either you're on the shy side or you're in denial <laughs> because all of us go through change and transition all the time in all different parts of our lives. And so today um, I'd like to share with you, well, first of all, a quote from Gordon Livingston who wrote a book called 60 True Things. Happiness requires an ability to tolerate uncertainty. And we're never taught how to think about change and transition in our lives. We're taught life is this ladder you should climb <laughs> and that it should just keep going up, 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 more, 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 better, better, better. And in reality, we all know that that's not true. That's the myth. So instead, I'm here to be able to share with you a new model of how to think about change and transition in our lives. So my goals for today are these. One to give you a sense of what the world looks like right now, especially the world of work. There have been a lot of changes in the 21st century. And in order to really be able to navigate it, we have to understand that it's a different world we're living in than the one that was the 20th century. Back in the 20th century, there were some rules and you know how you navigate that kind of pro procedure. And now, boy, they don't work anymore. We've got to find new rules for the new world in which we live. And I also want to introduce you to, uh, it is a universal and cross-cultural cross because we've actually shared this with people all over the world, not telling them what it is, just showed them this cycle of change and transition and they got it. Didn't matter where they were from, didn't matter what backgrounds they had. So it seems to be a human experience of how we go through change and transition. And I want to share that with you today. So there's some takeaways. Yeah, understanding those two things, but also helping you understand that you have choices to make. So in this crazy world that we live in and trying to figure out how to get from here to there, there are decisions that you need to make and that you can. And I also hope at the end of this you'll feel inspired a bit to go find and follow your passion and purpose in life and design a life you love. So those are my goals. Or do you, any others? Anything in an hour and a half? We've got a lot to cover. <laughs> but please, I want this to be interactive, both with the online community and with everyone here in the room. So ask questions. Let this be a conversation, not just a one-way uh, speech. That's not my idea of fun, and I don't think it would be yours either. What else? Anything else you need? No? Okay. Let's, let's move on. I want to share a video with you. Uh, I've edited it down a bit. It's online. You can find it. It's called Did You Know 2013, and I'm sure they'll be coming out with a 2014 soon. Uh, and it, it gives you a sense of what the world looks like now. And... Um, I actually uh, spoke last night to Seattle Pacific University seniors, the senior week over there, and for them I said, well, you know, as you're watching this, think about what opportunities all of these changes might elicit, because all of the shifts that are happening um, can really be ways of 
finding solutions that you be the right person to um, solve that problem. So it's called Shift Happens. Let's watch it. Had hints that this is where we were going? <laughs> Comments? Surprises? No surprises? <laughs> it changes a lot, but in some ways it doesn't change anything that's fundamental. And uh, Michael's going to come around with the microphone so people over the Internet can also hear some of the comments. So it doesn't change anything, really, you said. Well, mm -hmm. fun many, fundamental things aren't, many fundamental things are unchanged. There, it changes some aspects of our lives dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are those things that aren't changed? Well, the importance of relationships, say, for example. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So there are some basic things that we'll always have in our lives, even with all this information technology and this information world that we have out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some more things about um, the world of work that I want to share with you. The 21st century, um, did you know that in addition to uh, change occurring at warp speed, that one-third of the U.S. workforce currently, right now, are considered freelancers. Freelancers, and this is the, these are how they define freelancing. Temporary, contingent, casual, contract, part-time, external, atypical, adjunct, consultant, and self-employed. Those are all the categories. And a third, if a third of the U.S. workforce is working that way, um, imagine that companies who are hiring these people, I mean, here in Seattle, you often ask somebody at, you know, one of the high-tech companies, um, you know, what their position is, and they'll be an independent contractor. They're not going to be an employee. It used to be, 10 years ago, 70% of all jobs that existed were considered core jobs with benefits. 10 years ago. Now, 40%. Just 10 years later. And you can imagine that that number is going to continue to decrease because companies don't have to pay benefits, right? They, they're in it for their bottom line. And so anything that they can um, do to increase that income that they've got going on, they're going to do. And this benefits them. So it also is going to encourage sort of our systems to shift. I mean, we see it already with the healthcare system. If people are not working for benefits, how do they get health care? Um, hoping that some things are going to change more dramatically than they have been, but we won't go there. Um, it, it, instead of finding a job, it's going to be inventing a job, and maybe not just one job. They talk about portfolio careers. I actually have a portfolio career right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it means you do a lot of different things and you combine them up. So since I'm, I, I had been working, I founded Centerpoint, I had been working there, but now I, we've got a, a CEO, an executive director, and people managing it and people working there. I just come in every so often and I'll see some clients or I'll do some training. Um, so that's one thing I do. And then I do a lot of speaking every place in the world these days. And that's another thing I do. And then there's the book and the writing that I do and the blogs that I write. And then and, um, you know, there's the consulting that I do with organizations. So it, just a whole bunch of things put together. So we're working more flexibly, and we're working in different kinds of organizations than we've done before. So we just have to shift our perspective and really uh, realize that it's not the way that it was, and it's not going to go back to the way that it was. Um, and it doesn't mean that there aren't jobs out there. <laughs> there are jobs out there, but they are are going to be looking a little bit differently than they have in the past. So um, in um, the changes that have happened, well, globalization, you know, in production, if it costs less to manufacture something in China and ship it halfway across the world than it does to manufacture it in the next neighborhood over, um, that, that's a real interesting shift that's been happening. The rise in knowledge work, so less manufacturing, less... Um, goods and, and um, more services are happening. And alternative employment arrangements, so working from a coffee shop or, uh, as I said, portfolio careers. It's a di different way, it's a more entrepreneurial way to think about work. So instead of just getting a job and being in the job and, and um, working for, for the man, you are now really looking at how does work fit into my life? 
And because of that, we have to look at what do I want work to, you know, what, what role do I want work to play in my life? In uh, the career development field, there is a thing called protein careers, and this gentleman Hall came up with this in 1976. Nobody was listening to him back then, though. <laughs> it was way too early. He's updated it since, but he talks about uh, the traditional organizational career and um, protein careers. And who's in charge in a traditional career? Well, obviously the organization is, and in a protein career, the individual is. And what are the core values? Well, advancement in a traditional career, climbing the ladder. Protein career, it's about freedom and growth. It's, is this position meeting my needs right now? Is this a good fit? Uh, I, I've uh, trained with Richard Bowles, the guy who wrote What Colors Your Parachute, and he always talks about a job is the intersection of what you love doing and what needs doing in the world. And as long as that arrangement and that agreement is there, you, you've got a contract with that employer to have that position. Well, what if something changes in terms of the world of work. Well, you'll have to go find another intersection. Or what happens when something changes and you're not interested in what you're doing anymore? That's not your vision. Well, you're going to have to find another intersection. So it's choices that you have to make throughout our lives and continuing no matter what age we are. I mean, uh, a lot of people in the um, baby boomer generation who are thinking about retirement are not Thinking about retirement in the same way. It isn't, I mean, we might have 30 more years of life left. That's a whole lifetime. You know, when we used to, 200 years ago, well, even 100 years ago, live to be 40 or 45, that's a different kind of uh, lifetime span than now when we're talking about 80 and 90 years. So we have to reinvent ourselves over the course of that time. So the degree of mobility in a traditional career is very low, but it's very high in a protein career because, as I said, it's entrepreneurial. And the success criteria is all about, in a traditional career, what's your position level? What's your salary? Do you have a window? <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that we look at. But in a protein career, it's psychological success. It's, do I love this? Am I excited about this? Um, do I want to spend so much time every day doing this kind of work? And the key attitudes are, you know, commitment to the organization in a traditional career, but in a protein career, it's all about work satisfaction and um, per your own professional commitment. So again, making choices from the inside out, not the outside in. Not finding, you know, finding how you fit yourself into the world of work, but how work fits into your life. And that's uh, a statement that's been made by Dr. Mark Savickas, who's a career development theorist and uh, a mentor of mine, actually. And in his closing session at the National Career Development Association conference this past year, which we celebrated 100 years of the field. We've been around a long time. <laughs> actually, that's where all counseling came from, was career development. But he says, that, this was said in 1910, the trouble with our times is that the future is not what it used to be. Boy, can we say that the same thing? This turn of this century, the future is not what it used to be. Things will continually shift and change over time, and we have to be prepared for that. If you're interested in hearing all of Dr. Savickas' talk, you can go to ncda.org, and there's a link to his closing keynote there. It really is It's a long, hour-long um, uh, speech, but it's fascinating because it just tells you the whole... Um, sort of connects the dots between all the trends that are happening in the world, all the decisions people are needing to make, and um, what happened in the career development field over the course of the time and where we're going. So he talks a lot about the world of work, and it can be really helpful. He, he in his talk, said, in the past, one's job or career fixed one's identity virtually for life. You know, and as lawyers, we know that. That's a really, I mean, you, you have spent a lot of time investing in that identity, both time and money. And so when you go to a party, that's a proud thing that you present, right? Well, to most people. <laughs> um, to a lot of people. But in contemporary life, it's full of ambiguity and tension because it's fragmented, tentative, experimental, discontinuous, and ever-changing. There are, things are changing so fast that people are losing a sense of who they are and where they're going. Uh, because the, the whole 
road, the path, is shifting as, as they walk down it. In this uncertain world, the only certainty is what you make inside yourself and with those you love. So as you mentioned, relationships will always be there. But we need to, again, define the whole picture of what do you love, what do you need in your life, how does work fit into that. Career planning can't just be career planning because it's like planning in a vacuum. Um, all these other shifts and choices are being made in your life, and you've got to build them all together and look at how do they fit as a whole, a whole picture of where you're going and what you want. So what I'd like to do is share with you a new perspective on how to think about your choices and your um, path towards getting what you want and how to understand chaos. And this is a model I'd like to share with you, a model of change and transition that we've developed at Centerpoint. It's the, the basis of the book that I wrote, and it has been a helpful tool in reframing people's um, perspectives on how to think about what's next in their life. So it's, um, we're going to go through it pretty quickly. Uh, we usually spend a lot of time at Centerpoint making sure that people get this. You'll cognitively get it. I mean, you'll just look at the thing and you'll, you'll get it. Uh, you're all bright people. But I'd like to spend a little time walking through it so that you can uh, really understand where it's come from and how it's different from what we've done in the past. So in the past, we've had a linear perspective, right? Where climb the ladder, <laughs> climb the mountain, Everything you do should build upon what you've done before, uh, that the goal is arriving and living happily ever after. You've all seen the Stephen Sondheim show, a Broadway show, Into the Woods. Has anybody seen that? Oh, you have to watch it, right? Isn't it great? It's like all, the whole first half of the show is vignettes about all the fairy tales that we grew, grew up with. And they lived happily ever after, except after intermission. <laughs> He finishes the stories. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so Prince Charming and uh, what, what else? There's, there's another prince in there. Well, they're really not interested in Cinderella and, and uh, anymore. He's really interested in Snow White, you know. <laughs> there's a lot of different changes. Happen. Life is messy is the point of the show. And when we think about a linear approach, we feel like, okay, it's, it's got to be controllable, and that everything we do is on this, you know, this formula that we need to adhere to to keep us on the straight and narrow path. And the formula, they're good things, like work hard, you know, be persistent, set clear goals, think positively. You know, those, are, those are good things, but what happens if we're trying to do that and we're trying to be on this path and our life doesn't feel like it's moving in that direction? It feels like it's falling apart. It feels like it you know, is not doing what everybody else's life is doing. Well, let me just back off from that for a sec, because I remember working with um, a lawyer in, in uh, individual session once, and, and she said, you know, I look around my firm, she worked for one of these big firms downtown here, she said, I look around my firm, and everybody loves what they do. And I said, remind me what firm you work for. <laughs> and she told me, and I went, mm, that's not the case. <laughs> right? Everybody wants to put that facade up, that persona of, I love this. But I tell you, there's a lot of people out there who are questioning it, right? And um, what we have to do, instead of just trying to, you know, get this thing to work and trying to control it and see it as, it's either success or I'm a failure, to um, change the viewpoint from this linear approach to a cyclical one. And a cyclical approach is not a new idea. It's an ancient idea. When you look at cultures who, who live close to nature, they understand the cycles of life, and they understand and apply that, that knowledge to their rites of passage in their lives. And so look at native cultures with the medicine wheel, where you walk through the four directions on a path towards wholeness. Or in Eastern cultures, the yin-yang. I mean, there's, I, I did some research for the book, and even in um, the Middle Ages, there was the Wheel of Fortune, and Fortuna would turn the wheel at her whim. You never knew when it was going to happen, because that's the way life is. Life is unpredictable. Anything can happen at any time. And we need to create our sort of constructs that we live within to deal with that uncertainty, because it could get overwhelming, right? Anything could happen at any time. How do we, you know, what's the point? 
And uh, instead, we need to really look at uh, focusing on this whole thing as a journey, not a destination, that we create our own meaning in those constructs. And what is it for you? So uh, it allows for the inner questioning, the inner introspection, and the outer task of what do I do, how do I make this work? But we need both. We need the inner and the outer. So that's an overview on where this comes from. In psychology and human development, this is a relatively new idea. Even though it's ancient in so many other ways. There was a guy in the 60s, Daniel Levinson, wrote a book, Seasons of a Man's Life, and uh, came up with a longitudinal study to look at what happens over the course of the adult years. And he found that there were two time periods. One he called the life structure, where predominantly we have our fit in the world. We know our identity. We, uh, things are going pretty well. We go to a party. We know what to say. And um, that that alternated with times he called the life transition, where predominantly there was uncertainty, uh, chaos. Um, we don't have our fit. We're questioning our identity. And he found, interestingly enough, that it didn't just happen once, you know, that midlife crisis idea. It happened over the course of the adult years in sort of bigger chunks of every five to ten years. People were going from uh, structure to transition and back to structure again. Okay, five to ten years, average, seven-year itch, right? We know this. We know that things are going to change. We know we've got to reorient um, who we are and what we're looking at. Do you have a question back there? Yes. Oh, yes. We, let, let's, Michael, get you the... I'm sorry. Hi, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I think the values that you're talking about are, are what I'm uh, seeing in, in the workplace and so forth. I've heard about them and, and the, the need for a spirit of entrepreneurship and self-realization and so forth. I've heard about that since the 80s. My question that I have is how does the paradigm that you're laying out for us today reflect the current values and practices of the legal community in Washington State and with the Bar Association, what I'm seeing with uh, job announcements and so forth is, send us your law school transcript from 30 years ago. <laughs> send us your resume, you know, the path that you've been on, which might reflect the path you're going to go on. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm sensing a disconnect between what happens in the way law is practiced, even in the uh, 2000s and so forth, and, and what we're talking about today, mm -hmm. it, seemed to, it seems to be a value clash. You're absolutely right. And what's happened is the rules haven't caught up with the reality. So we're still living off of how you go job hunting and how employers find candidates. Right? That's starting to shift. People are realizing a lot of it's about relationship. It's about who you know, not uh, what you've done in the past. It's about what you can do in the future. And we need to shift that more and more. It's like people don't want things to change, you know, because we know how to go job hunting with a resume. <laughs> uh, we know the rules about that. We've done it for years and years, right? But to, to sort of toss out the resume a little bit <laughs> and go, that's not the most important thing. I tell you, over the years, I've seen so many people avoid these questions by spending time revising their resume. <laughs> oh, if I just get the resume right then I, I'll find the ideal dream job of mine. And it, it doesn't work that way. You really have to know, and we're going to talk a lot about, more about this, Elizabeth. We're going to talk about how important it is, how essential it is to figure out what your vision is. What's your purpose? What do you want to make a difference with? How do you want to change things? How, because of who you are, and those things that um, are all part of your story as you were growing up. Um, you know, just to back, at, back away from that a little bit and say, you know, they, some theorists say that by age three, you know, we're plunked into this life. We don't choose our environment. We don't choose our communities. We don't choose the challenges that we're going to meet within that. We don't choose what ethnicity we are. We, we're just there, right? And we have to cope 
We have to find ways, and we look outside of ourselves for role models to figure out how to do that. And that by age seven, we really have formed a lot of those coping strategies so that when we, um, we, we have to deal with the environment that we're, we're dealt, there are strengths and talents that have been um, developed in us in order to cope with that, those environments. And those are the basis of our story that we continue to use all throughout our lives and build on and shift and change. But essentially, um, who we are is a story that continues to unfold, but it's based in our, our early childhood. Yes, another question. Michael? That's, that's what we want to happen. That's what should happen. I'm sorry, that's what we want to have happen. Uh -huh. That's what should happen. Yes. Those are the values we want to lean into. But are they the values that exist in the community, in the professional community in which we want to practice? Uh, are, are they the things that we need to create, or are, are they the existing reality uh, that we're moving into uh, in the practice of law? I, I think we're in flux right now. I think that the future is not well-defined. I mean, being in a new century, things have, are, are shifting dramatically. It, it, it's a, over history, you'll see the beginning, beginnings of all centuries. That has happened. That has shifted. And I think we're just in flux, and we don't know how to do this yet. And what I hope that I can do today a little bit is give you a different way of thinking about it so that um, even though the environment out there might not be changing yet, and it might not be changing as quickly as we'd like it to change, or it's not adapting, and it's not agile enough to deal with the changes that, are, are, that exist right now, that you can have the choice to do it in a way that works for you. Because, yeah, it's not going to be clear, and it's not going to be set out, and it's not going to be a straight path, ever. Um, so we need to figure out ways of doing this differently. To continue on with the... Um, the cycle, so if we, we drew a uh, line down the center of the circle, and we, would, we show that we move from transition, the bottom of the cycle, to, towards structure. And this is the active, out there, doing side of the cycle. We have a clear vision. We have a clear sense of direction and a dream for which we're, we're striving and we're moving towards, right? And the energy is there. We're excited. We're passionate. We're making this thing happen. Versus the other side of the cycle where we move from structure towards transition, we don't have a clear vision. We don't know where we're going. We're questioning it. And it happens in big and little ways. But, you know, there are some people who, I, I'm sure you've all run into them, they're, they're idea people. So they might have lots of ideas on what they could do next or where they're going or what's important to them. But there's no energy. There's no energy available to make any of those ideas happen. So we have to look at clarity of vision and energy available. What's there? And the activity here is more receptive. It's inward. It's, it's um, stepping in to find a new vision for who I am. And that introspection, that inner work, is not real supported in our culture. <laughs> but we still need to do it. And... Um, Time, you know, immemorial is, um, is it just proves the, the ancient Greeks were asking these questions. Um, know thyself, right? Uh, it, we've been trying to underscore the importance of living from the inside out for so many years. Uh, maybe now, maybe now. Although, you know, it's interesting, um, this is an aside. This linear thing versus cyclical, I think things are changing. You know, Elizabeth, I think things are changing because... Um, you see the corporate logos these days? They're all circles. We've gotten away from the mountains and the arrows. I've been watching it over the last 15, 20 years. It's fascinating. So there's something happening. There's something more organic. Um, when we look at the environmental movement, you know, and the recycling things that are so important, I think that's sort of um, supporting the idea that we can recycle our lives. And that we aren't going to do one thing for 30 years and the same thing anymore. So both are essential, the inner and the outer. It's built into our physiology. There's activity and rest. We have to sleep at night. We can't stay awake 24 hours a day. It doesn't, it, it's just not possible. We breathe in and we breathe out. We need both. 
or a call on the EMTs, we got a real problem there, right? So both are essential. Even when we make decisions, we, we step back to check in with ourselves and then step out again. So we go through these cycles all the time. What I'd like to share with you is this natural cycle of change that we can apply to the, the transitions that are at work in, in our own lives. So it's like having a map on how to go through uncertainty. And we use a seasonal metaphor. Not that each phase happens in a particular season, but it has the characteristics of that season. Now, before we get really into it, what I'd like you to do, both people who are here and people who are online, is to do a little sort of mini-assessment, okay? Um, and this mini-assessment is in the materials that we handed out and that you, you have. It's a way of evaluating how ready are you. It says this life career self-test on the top. Oh, somebody needs materials. <laughs> yeah, they were out on the... Uh, oh, okay, somebody will get you, get you a set. If you want to do it online um, for a self-scoring model, you can take out your phone or your tablet and, and make that happen. There's, we haven't transferred it over to our new website yet, so it's still on our old website. And, but here's the, um, the address, old.cpinst.org backslash capital start. Uh, backlash capital self and test and you can um, you can do it that way and uh, it'll add up the numbers for you if you're doing it on paper you're going to have to do some math <laughs> uh, but there are five questions there I want you to pick one aspect of your life that's in transition just one we can't look at the whole thing because it gets really confusing. We're just going to go for one. So if it's your career, or maybe it's your sense of self, or maybe it's your relationship, or maybe it's your geographical location, right? What is it that's in transition right now um, and is challenging you? And answer these five questions around that one aspect. Questions about how that works or what that might look like. Okay, let me know when you're done with that, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay, well, let's start with summer in the cycle of change, because this is the climb the ladder part of it. This is the part we know, and on uh, another handout that you have, it's called How the Career Process Really Works. Uh, I, I gave you a simplified version of the cycle versus the more in-depth because we have so little time together. So I just wanted to make it more focused on the career piece and, and make it more um, easy. So summer is career management. So how, how many people had 111 points or more? Nobody in this room. Anybody online? <laughs> 111 points? Probably that's a good thing because you're being really honest with yourselves. <laughs> you wouldn't probably be at this workshop if you were on target <laughs> because summer starts at a commitment point where we have a vision and we have the energy and the passion and we're building, launching, growing it, making it work, and we're going from challenge to mastery in any part of our life that we're, we're um, going through. And we, we sort of are aiming for a, what we call a positive plateau up at the upper part of the circle. And positive plateau isn't, plateau sometimes can, you know, connotate sort of stagnation or something like that. But what I'm talking about in positive plateau is, yeah, you have arrived at some level of what you set out to do, and it's gotten a little easier. It's like a garden in full bloom in summer, right? You're ready to reap the fruit off the vine and, um, and reap the benefits of all that you've built. So things get a little easier. Often at that positive plateau, people talk about balance. You know, I want all that I built, and I want the rest of my life too now. Now that I've got it, you know, it's a little bit easier. I can delegate. <laughs> I don't have to, you know, um, be involved in every single little aspect of things. In relationship, it's that place of just being solid with the person. You know, you know you can count on it. It doesn't mean it's not going to change, not going to have different kinds of, of um, shifts going on and growth happening, but, but it's solid. And we can have smaller transitions through summer. So where 
the, the vision is still on target. We're still passionate about it. But the container, the form that it has taken doesn't work anymore. That's what happened in my career. When I first started out as a career counselor, I was in a university setting back on the East Coast. And I had... Um, I loved it. Oh, my goodness. It was just like, I found this? How can... Wow. <laughs> All right. I, I'm very fortunate. And two years after, I was like, mm, I'm not sure. Uh, something's not working. Um, and I didn't know if it was the whole career. I didn't know what it was. So I had to step back and really ask myself, what's going on here? And what I found was it wasn't the work. That was still passionate for me. But it was the environment I was in. I was working at a really large university with a lot of bureaucracy. And I'm sort of creative. And I like autonomy. And it wasn't working for me. So I needed to find another container for my vision. And that's how I ended up working at a law school. Um, they hired me even though I didn't even know a lawyer at the time. They taught me everything that there was to know about the legal profession. And, um, and I stayed there and I loved it because the environment, it was like a family. I'm actually, since I moved from the East Coast here, I, I'm still in touch with people that I worked with there. They're like, they're, I, I, you know, I sang at the dean's daughter's wedding and his father's funeral, and um, he came out, he and his wife came out for my wedding here, and, you know, they, we're still in touch with, and it, it's, it was just such a wonderful environment. Yeah, that was a law school, can you imagine? <laughs> it, it, the dean at the time was just, and I think it's still that way, but um, the dean was an amazing person. I learned a lot from him. Uh, but, so I had to find a new container when I moved to Seattle. And I couldn't move my job, so I had to find a new thing. And I was looking for CenterPoint. I was clear about what I needed, but CenterPoint didn't exist. So I actually ended up doing sort of an exploratory thing where I started my own career counseling practice, got in touch with people who, lawyers who needed some assistance in terms of career counseling, and continued that work. So um, that built until I could find other people to collaborate with and, and create CenterPoint. And now CenterPoint's been around 21 years. So another container. Different containers, still same vision for what I want to accomplish with my life, right? So we can have smaller transitions. You can hear the, the passion for what my work is is still alive for me and because it really is my life's meaning. It's my life's purpose. It's why I'm here. It's to help people think about and, and really um, learn through the development, what I call developmentally difficult times in their lives. Um, I, I need to be there with people to accompany them on that pro in that process, and I'm still excited about it. I just I just love it, and I've found lots of different ways to do it. And as I've grown, it's changed, it's expanded, it's 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 shifted. But the basic foundational vision is the same. Now, um, if the vision, however, is not working anymore, if you're finding that it's dying, it's in decline. You have less energy for it. It's harder to get up in the morning. You don't have the oomph that you had before. It's like, oh, dreading. Um, we go into the fall. <laughs> Splat. <laughs> um, it's that free fall. That's, it's that sense of, uh-oh, I don't have this foundation under my feet anymore. Uh-oh, um, what's going on? I, I, I need to look at this differently. See, one of three things can happen. One, you get there, you do it, but you just outgrow it. It's just too small. It doesn't work anymore. You need something more. It was okay. You were successful, but it, it, you need something else. Or two, you get there and you find out, oh, it's not what I thought it was. Having worked in a law school and then seeing students come back or alumni come back a couple of years later... <laughs> Uh, that's a common thing. Oh, I thought the practice of law was going to be a little different <laughs> from what uh, um, I was imagining. It's sort of like when uh, Bill Moyers interviewed Joseph Campbell back you know, a number of years ago, and Joseph Campbell said, yeah, it's like you get to the top of the ladder, but you find it's against the wrong building. Right? So it's, it's not what you set out to do, and you realize, oh, this is not what I wanted. Or you're going great guns, and it gets taken away from you. You get laid off, or you know the market crashes, or whatever happens, and and it, it makes you question the whole thing and say, "Is this what I really wanted anyway?" All these things shifting and changing. Our first reaction to this is typically denial. Okay, well, you know, at least I have a job. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there in the world. We do the rationalization thing, you know. Um, what do you mean you're 
thinking about not practicing law anymore. You know, your friends and family say, uh, you're making a good living at that. What, you're going to give that all up? You know, and all those things, those messages that you get. So you just sort of distance and go, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I can put up with this. And that's what it is in fall, is putting up with. It's not thriving. It's not excitement. It's putting up with. And, and the denial is actually a normal, natural part of the process. we just got to go through that. Just like grieving, right? Which is the next, day, next stage in grieving is well, anger. Anger is the feeling victimized, feeling trapped, feeling like it's in everybody else's hands, like I have no control. Um, it's thrashing out. It's, it's the complaining, 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 complaining that we do. And we've all, you know had friends and family who've been in this, and colleagues sometimes even, in this stage, and it's just really exhausting, isn't it? All that venting, it's like, oh, call your friend up, oh, I thought I'd get your voicemail, <laughs> because you're so tired of hearing the complaining. It's just like, oh, not again. But you know what? It's a good sign, because we're not in denial. <laughs> Things have shifted. Now, it doesn't mean we can't get back into denial, because, you know, these things don't go linearly, um, and they go, they, uh, they're very cyclical, but, but the anger is good, and sometimes the anger can be directed inwardly or outwardly, and, you know, the, the complaining is outward, but inward, it's when we beat ourselves up, which we are also good at, and we really need to let go of that, but that happens. Next stage of, of fall is bargaining. It's a if only. If only uh, my boss was different, if only my spouse was different, if only, you know, if, all, if only I won the lottery, I'd be out of here in a minute. Or if only that perfect job shows up on that monster.com screen, <laughs> I'd just go, you know, wave into this thing that feels like it's trapping me. Because we are feeling trapped. And what we have to do is let go of it. And in the career process, it's a reevaluation. So reevaluation is uh, 30, to, uh, 30 points or fewer. Anybody in the room have want to admit that they have? It's okay. 30 points or fewer. And, and that means that you're, you know, you're in something right now that's not working for you. And you might be still trying to make it work, um, but it really you're, you're ready to let go of it because the energy is just not there and the clarity of vision is not there. So we're moving towards an ending of saying, no, the structure that I've been in, not it anymore. And I have to go into, I don't know. That's where the book the title came from, The Time Between Dreams. It's winter. Before we get there, there's a quote I'd like to share with you from Alan Cohen. He said, it takes a lot of courage to release the familiar and seemingly secure, to embrace the new. But there's no real security in what is no longer meaningful. There is more security in the adventurous and exciting for a movement. There is life, and in change, there is power. Um, he also said, and in, in another speech he gave is, you know, when I let go of something, which is what we're doing here, we're letting go of the structure. And it could just be a psychological letting go. You know, I'm out of here in a, in a year or six months or whatever. But the letting go is when I let go of something, I leave claw marks. <laughs> because there's some of us that have that style where we, we're good at making things work. And that's a wonderful trait. But in this stage, it gets us stuck. Because we're going to try to make things work. I'm like that. You know, I have to, all the people I work with, I tell them, when I'm trying to make something work and it's not working, let me know, because I don't know. I just, you know, I just try throwing ideas at it and, and, and trying to um, find a, a new solution to it. It was like one time when our, um, our phone system in, in Centerpoint, I remember this, our phone system was in fall. And I was in denial. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe we could do this. Oh, maybe we could do that. But these things happen. We, we, we've got to pay attention to what are our strengths, what are our styles, what are our um, challenging areas that are, might get us stuck along the way and get the support that we need. So in working um, into the next phase of the cycle, winter, finding a new vision, in the career process map, it's renewal and self-assessment. Really two phases of winter. Uh, first phase is continuation of the tearing down, letting go process. And the second phase is where we find new vision. Um, 31 to 60 points. Anybody? 31 to 60 points. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of folks in the, in the room. Uh, because this is the 
you know, that's not working. I know what I don't want, but I don't know what I want. That really describes winter. And there really isn't a lot of support for this. You know, how, how often, you know, do you go to, well, the worst thing you could do at this time in your life is go to any kind of reunion, right? And the first thing out of people's mouths are, so what are you doing now? Who are you with? So for years, we've been, we've been um, joking at Centerpoint. We're going to make our first fortune selling T-shirts to people in transition that say, don't ask, I'm not telling. <laughs> because it's, it's so hard. You don't have a lot of energy. You don't know where you're going. You know, how much support is there out there for, you know, having no clue? Um, and when you say, I don't know, they go, okay, and they back off, right? Because they're uncomfortable with, with that. I have a quote in the book about um, someone who said, yeah, I know my summer friends and my winter friends. And when I'm in winter, I don't go to my summer friends because <laughs> they don't get it. They don't understand. It's, it's, it's not a supported place in our society to be in this stage of, I don't know. Well, we talked about the, the um, fairy tales before, you know, the happily ever after stories. Well, we have other stories in our lives. And it's the hero or the heroine's journey. And the hero or the heroine leaves the known and walks into the unknown, the wilderness, oftentimes the underworld, to go fight dragons and come out transformed, right? We have those stories. We have the Harry Potters of the world. We have the Lord of the Rings. We have all these stories that are out there. But this is not an external wilderness that we're going into in these winters. It's an internal one. It's the who am I really? How do I align who I am with what I do? How do they, how do they work together? And in winter, we find those answers. And that's why it's so, such a rich place and if we had more time, we'd really spend um, some of it looking at when have you been in winters in the past? And, you know, what have you learned from those? And what's helped during those times? Because there's lots to learn from, from when we've done it before. So depression is the next stage of the grieving process, right? We think of it as a developmental depression versus a clinical one because it's based in our real-life experiences. I mean, the things that are happening, are they're, they're sad. We're grieving. We've let go of something that's been important to us. And we don't know how it's going to fit in the future. You know, relationships go through these cycles sometimes. And they don't have to end up in um, splitting up or divorce. When, you know, the uh, often I will see at center point people who have gotten together and they've had a family and now they're going through empty nesting and they've, but for 18 years or 20 years or however, now adolescence is lasting even longer than that, um, you, you've, been, you've been parenting and that's your vision for, you know, a, a big part of your relationship together. And when that ends, so who are we together? Do we, can we get back to the original vision that we had? Does that still fit us because we've changed as people? Or do we have to really look for a new vision? And that's a challenging thing to be able to, you know, really step back and go, so why are we together? What are we, you know, what's the, what's the purpose of our, our connection here? And... Um, and every relationship that comes back out of winter, I always see as such a strong one because it is a recommitment to the, the, the partners together. Acceptance is the second phase of winter, and that's where we find a new vision. And vision is, I, I, I use that word, but you know, you can describe it any way you want. What we have to do is really look at who are you specifically, clearly, and in detail. We can't stay with generalities. And this is what um, I think in, in overall career counseling has, in, in the last century, is really focused on. You know, it's like, oh, take this test, and it will tell you um, how you are similar to other people who have answered those questions the same way. And it, it will tell you what their choices were and what they decided to do so that you can then match you know, into that and, and relate to that. And maybe that's what you want to do. Well, in this century, it's not how are you similar to others. How are you different? How are you unique? What is that story that is uniquely yours that you have to define and then 
define that vision for. And it's not general skills. You know, you, you open up a lot of these career books, and they all are, they have lists of skills. Check off all the skills. I like to teach. <laughs> I like to write. I like to whatever, right? Oh. Okay. That's a good place to start if you know nothing about, oh, how, how about this one? I like to work with people. <laughs> right? That one always gets me. I mean, who, you have to work with people. <laughs> but, but what does it mean? All of these things are just such broad terms. They're big boxes. And what we need to do is narrow it down to, so what's your way of teaching that you just love? For one person, it might be, oh, you know, I love learning a technical body of knowledge about something, getting up in front of 150 people, using humor in an hour and a half, communicate and educate this group about what that is. And um, at the end of it, the light bulbs go off and, wow, that feels great. And I move on to the next one. Teaching could also be sitting one-on-one with somebody and asking the right questions um, and just having them process what they're learning around this particular thing. And then when the light bulb goes off, wow, that's rewarding for me. That's teaching too, right? So we can't stay with big things. We've got to narrow down to who are you and what are your talents specifically. And let me give you an example of, of how I did this one. I was trying to figure out geographically where I needed to move. I love this story. I've told it a lot of times. So if you've ever heard it before, I apologize. But I love it because it really um, indicates that the importance of the specificity of this. So what I did was I actually took a, a, an exercise from What Color Should Parachute? And I've trained, trained with uh, Richard Bowles, who wrote that book. And, and uh, it was back in the 1980s. Right? And um, I was able to sit down and go, okay, so what would be ideal? And here's this geographical chart in the book that I found really helpful. We all have different styles. Sometimes it, things work, sometimes they don't work for us. But what he did was he asked all the places you've ever lived and then you write down all the things you hated about those places. Because <laughs> it's always easier to come up with the negatives first, right? <laughs> Especially when you're in transition. So you, all the things you hated. And then you flip those things. If it wasn't that, what would make it perfect for you? And you come up with that list. And then you add to that list anything else, ideally. You know, just dream, dream. What would paradise look like for you, for me? That's what I did. And I added to that list. And then prioritized the list. What are the most important factors? I ended up actually with a list that was, um, and I'm a list maker, so 20 items long. And in that 20 item thing, this is how specific you have to get. One item was, the temperature had to be between 30 degrees and 90 degrees. It had to cool off at night in the summers and had to have low humidity. I came from the East Coast. I came from New York. So you can see. But if I stayed with temperate climate, if I stayed you know, with a more general term, can you see how that might be really confusing? Where do I start? There are lots of places that are temperate. I have to define what I wanted. I also, another item on the list was, it, um, I, it had to be, um, you had to be able to see water and mountains in the same view. Now, I didn't know a place like this existed. Now, all of us know who are here know that this is Seattle, right? But I didn't know. I had a dream without knowing what form it was going to take. So that's what's important about winter. We have to spend time gathering all the clues, allowing those clues to really come to the surface. And we get stuck, especially as lawyers, because um, we're programmed to find the answer and think things through, think things through, and this is not a thinking process all the time, right? It's also an experiential one. But so, say, say something comes, a clue comes up to the surface, and if I had said, "Oh yeah, water and mountain in the same view," oh, there are so few places that would have any of this. That no, maybe I need to shift that or just toss that one out, right? Or something else comes to the surface. Oh yeah, but I, you know, well, work-wise, couldn't get paid for that toss that idea out, right? So we're tossing out these really important clues, and what we end up with is this watered-down compromise that we have no energy for, and so then we don't do anything and we stay stuck. Instead, we have to divide this process into two distinct steps. Clue gathering, sifting through the clues, defining it, articulating it specifically. Then, how? How do I get this in my life? Who out there needs what I have to offer? But we have to do them in two distinct um, 
phases. It can't be all meshed together. So that analytical problem solving thing has to go on the side while we do the clue gathering process. That's what we do in passion search at center point. We allow people to come together in a small group and just really look at what are the clues and look at, um, it's not, you know, we have exercises that we have people do, but it's not the exercises that give you your answers. It's the threads and the patterns that run throughout all the exercises. They keep coming up. By the end of the class, we're laughing at each other because, like, oh, there's that thing again. <laughs> That's so special to you because you have a way of putting this together with this for this purpose and on behalf of these kind of people. And so you come out with a vision. And again, the vision is the description, and the vision is clear, and it's passionate. Then we can go into um, spring with the vision to ask how. How can I get this in my life? How can I make this happen? Who needs what I have to offer? And that's a creative process in spring. It's building the bridge to the dream. And that's exploration and marketing in the career process map. And that's 61 to 110 points. Anybody in the room? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, and anything that you'd like to you know, talk about, these, these different experiences and these different seasons, I'm just really open to. Um, spring is, okay, I have a, a description of what I want, but I don't know what the form is. And this is, again, where people sometimes can get stuck because they say, okay, well, I have this description and I should just be able to know what the job title is or where I might be able to do this. And that's not the case. What we have to do instead is take that description out into our networking appointments and say, you know, because um, people will ask you, so what are you looking for? And you can say, I don't know what it's called, but here's what I want to make a difference with. Um, I'm working actually with a lawyer who's in, in New York right now and working long distance. And, and she, um, she realized she's at this stage in her career where she's ready to make a big difference. And she's done a lot of different things over the course of her life, um, divorce mediation, arbitration. She's also a therapist and a, a lawyer. And she's um, uh, worked with um, survivors of domestic violence and all these issues, you know, in have come together for her and now she wants to do it on like a policy level bigger making a bigger difference with all this knowledge that she has and so her her vision statement and the heart of it was i want to make the world a safer place for women and girls wow when somebody asks her what are you looking for don't know how i'm going to do this yet i'm open to your ideas but i want to make the world a safer place for women and girls it's got energy right it's in, so we can always tell when vision statements are on target. So when you're in spring and you go out there and people say, so what are you looking for? Two things happen when you articulate this. One is they get your energy. They get your passion. They get curious. They want to know more. So, oh, wow. Well, tell, tell me about that. Where did that come from? Um, you know, and, and they start asking you questions. The second thing that happens is they come up with resources for you. Have you thought of this? Have you talked to so-and-so? Oh, I, I need you to meet this person. Or this meeting is coming up that you need to be at. Right? Ideas will be generated. So if one or both of those things are not happening, then you know it's another clue in the process. And the clue is, oh, Either I'm not ready because the passion's not there, um, the energy is not there, I'm not excited when I'm expressing this to someone else, or you're not clear enough. And so that's when the ideas don't get generated. So either if they say, oh, that's, that's really interesting, tell me more. Oh, good luck to you. <laughs> right? Then you know you're not clear enough because they don't come up with ideas. Um, or if they'll say, you know, if you, you're clear, but you're not just, I mean, they won't get past the energy thing. Um, so if, if you talk to somebody and uh, they just say, well, good luck, and well, yeah, get in touch with me at some point, or whatever, some generality, uh, you don't even get to be clear with them because they, they're just not interested. So 
but your, your, your vision has to be clear enough and specific enough to engage them. And so if those aren't happening, you know enough to step back and really look at how can I clarify more specifically what I'm looking for um, or how can I do the other work. See, sometimes, and as, you, as we're talking, probably you've, you're, you're thinking this, I hope you're thinking this, but there are different parts of our lives that are different places in the cycle. So our career might be in spring, but another part of us might be still in winter. So we have to look at all the different aspects of who we are and what's going on in order to know what the next immediate step is. So there was this one woman at Centerpoint who, um, she, she was really clear about her career vision. She, you know, she could articulate it. She wanted to go bigger and she wanted to, you know, be a, an executive director at a, a nonprofit organization. And she was like really, really clear and she was going out exploring, and she was going out networking, and she was applying for jobs, and she wasn't getting a single one. No bites. You know, or she'd get a little bit, but never get very far in the process. So she came in to just try to get a sense of what was going on. Well, it was, there, is, there was something in, in winter, which was her core. She was an empty nester and, and had been for a while, but she was a single parent. And her whole identity, everything she did in her life was to provide for her daughter and to make sure that her daughter had um, a really good life and the education she needed. So she sacrificed a lot of stuff internally to be able to be there for her. And now that her daughter was you know, off on her own and working and successful and, you know, um, she still had that role of mother, and that's who you know. That's what identified her, and she had to let go of that. She had to let go of that part of her. Not that she wasn't going to be a mother anymore, but in the same way, no. She had to be able to say, "That chapter is over. I'm a mother in a new way now." And then, what does that imply about who I am as a person? And her core—that's what we call our core. That sense of what I'm learning. It's, it's why you go to people like Heidi and Dan and, and Michael at the you know, Lawyer's Assistance Program to learn more about that, that part of ourselves um, so that we, we can see the relationship between the core and the career. Sometimes the core is leading. Sometimes we feel really good about ourselves. We get the self-esteem's there. We're, we're like going great guns. And then it's like, oh, the career needs changing because that was too small. Or it could be the other way around where your career changes. You get clear about that, but then the core is like, oh, there's still some things i got to learn in winter that, that are dragging this process. So by looking at all the different pieces of our life, lives, we can get a better sense of perspective on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So... Now, I'd like to um, do a couple things. One is, talk about working with the cycles. And there actually are, in your handouts, there's a, a sheet of paper that says activities that are helpful in the career process. Now, we're not going to go through that step by step, but um, sometimes people, this is not an end-all, be-all of lists, by the way. This is just the beginning of some ideas that might be helpful in fall, winter, spring, and summer. Because the, the activities are different. We can't be doing summer things in winter. <laughs> we don't have the energy for it. We can't do spring things in fall. I mean, when people come into the office and they say, there are no jobs out there, nobody is hiring. That's a clue for us. They're in fall. <laughs> because we got people in spring coming in every day getting jobs. Right? It's not about what's out there. It's about what's going on in here. And so you've got to really focus on that. Working with the cycles, this is a normal and natural process. This is not something that you force or you can overly control. You can make choices um, by understanding. It's sort of an organic kind of thing. You understand where you are and what's needed. It's like you can't control the seasons. They're going to unfold the way that they're going to unfold. We can make choices about what we're going to wear outside because of what season it is or what we're going to do with our garden because of what season it is. But the seasons just are. And that's what happens with this kind of a process in our lives. They, we go through change. And it's natural and normal. 
and that you have to be where you are. You, you can't be someplace else. You can't be uh, further ahead or further behind. We usually live in the future or live in the past, right, sometimes, where we want to be someplace that's better or different from where we are right now or, oh, if it was only um, back this way. We have to be in the present and really look at what's going on for me right now. What do I need right now? And the next one is energy is always available for the immediate next step. So when you check in with yourself and you say, what do I need? What do I have energy for right now? Such an important um, question in this process. What do I have energy for right now? And, you know, it's not a should. So if your heart says, I'm exhausted, I'm in winter with this. It's really tiring. I need some rest. A nap would be really nice right now. And our head goes, "Mm -mm, you can't take a nap. You have to go do this thing. Until we get that rest, we're not going to be able to do the next thing. So you might as well give in (laughs) to that need that's there, the energy need that's there. And that's a really, I think at the in working with the cycles, the two most important um, rules of thumb are that one and the next one is that you can't skip anything. So it, if it ever feels overwhelming, confusing, scary, or anxious, it means you're trying to skip something. So if you're overwhelmed or you feel confused or you're feeling like, ah, something's not working, it's scary, ah, I'm anxious, another clue in the process, um, it means that You're not ready for that particular step. So go back into the, what do I have energy for? And go and do that. Because that will then allow it to unfold, the process to unfold into the next thing that you do need to be doing. Look at your past experiences. Because... You, you know, sometimes when we go through um, a big change in our lives, sometimes they're smaller changes and sometimes they're bigger changes, right? And when we're going through a bigger change, sometimes we have change amnesia. It's like, oh, don't know how to do this, completely foreign to anything that I've experienced. But really, when we look at um, our past, we can learn a lot from what worked then and be able to apply it to the changes that we're going through now. So remember those times and, um, and think about you know, what did work, what didn't work. And the synchronicity that happens in spring. Spring is a synchronous kind of time. You know, people say, oh, that just fell in my lap. Well, yeah, we see all the work that they did to make it happen. But sometimes synchronicity can happen in other ways, which is um, nudges that we get. You know, that's that word that you hear multiple times in a day that catches your attention or that song on the radio that's just like whew, hits you like a ton of bricks. Those nudges happen. Let's listen to them because sometimes there's something important to hear from them. There was uh, one woman who came to one of our, our retreats. We have these four and a half day retreats where um, people really have to like turn off all technology for four and a half days it's very challenging but it's really great time to listen to ourselves and to take people through this process and um and uh she was in fall when she came to the retreat and she was in an if only bargaining stage if only only my my uh, spouse was different everything was okay if only my kids were different if only my job was different if only my boss was different and she was just like going through these if only kind of cycles and finally she realized you know i don't have any control over anybody else i can only make choices for myself and she stepped into winter and uh, uh was really learning a lot, a lot about herself. And she said, she called us a few days later because she said, you know, I was driving home and I found myself in that old pattern again. If only, if only, if only. And I was stopped waiting for the, uh, or I was waiting for the, the ferry. I was going towards the ferry. And she said, I looked up and there was this sign blinking at me. Stop, 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 stop. And she said, I just laughed. I went, oh, that's right. I don't have to do that that way anymore. <laughs> So these little little notices that happen to us each and every day, um, let's be listening on a more more deep level to them because they, they have a lot of good information for us. Um, and ask for help and support. You don't have to do this alone, but this process is not well supported out there. So we have to find the right 
um, support. It's why Centerpoint's been around for 21 years, because we, we haven't done a lot of marketing over those years, but uh, people send their friends and families and, and co-workers, and um, they, they have found it helpful, so they know that this is an environment that, that can be really useful for them. LAP is another one. I mean, there is support there for not knowing and being in that confusing time. So definitely find it. Questions. I, I, I've been talking at you a lot, and I, I apologize for that. But I want to know, you know, our responses. Yes. Oh, we have. We need the. Um, yeah. So people online can hear you too. Um, he's here, right up here. What I what I think I get from this um, seminar is what I might put in a cover letter? Mm -hmm. Am I also to look at my resume and determine whether the objectives um, are being reflected in the content? Yes. That's, and in spring, that's how you use the, the, the vision as, um, as a career objective on your resume, as the thing that you put on LinkedIn, as you know, the communication that you want to have with others around who you are and what your value is, what you bring to the table, what you want to make a difference with. That is much more, um, you know, there's a lot of talk out there about branding yourself and marketing, and, uh, and those words work if they work for you, but it, it, it's, that's what we're doing. We're communicating in an effective way, and in a way... Let me tell you a little story about that, too. There's a, a, actually, it was a, uh, a neighbor of mine. She, her, her husband is a lawyer, and she, was a, she had been laid off um, from her job, and so she was applying for different things. And she, in her heart of hearts, knew what she wanted, but she, you know, she, she went through all the resumes and all. And he would go through her cover letters for her. And, um, and say, no, 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 this doesn't sound business-like enough. You, you know, use this phrase instead. And, and all those letters that she sent out got absolutely no response. <laughs> and then she saw an opening at the zoo. And she had always wanted to work at the zoo and since she was a kid. I mean, this was just so exciting for her to see this opportunity. And so she wrote the letter from her heart. She didn't show it to her lawyer husband. <laughs> before she sent it off. And it talked about how um, her experiences as she was growing up about being at the zoo and what that meant to her and why she wanted to be there and what she brought to the table. She got the job. So, it, you know, it's, it's so important to spend time really doing that internal clarification because it's going to make the process more effective when you get to spring. Another question, Elizabeth? Yes. Another question. Wait a minute. We need the microphone for you so the people online can hear that too. There we go. Thank you. I think that it's reasonable to assume then from what you've said that what must appear in a person's cover letter and what must appear in the resume in order to get the job that you're made for might not have anything to do with what you've done in the practice of law in the past. Mm -hmm. And so is it is it fair then to say that your resume needs to be a new kind of document in that it should reflect the things that you've loved to do in all aspects of your life rather than, oh, um, I was an ALJ for three years and I was a prosecutor for three more years and I was a this and I was a that. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile what employers may be looking for with what you want your resume to say? Right. I, I would really encourage you to, to um, if especially you're moving in a new direction, like you want to do something different from what you've done in the past, forget the resume for a while. Because <laughs> that's not going to be your most effective job search strategy. Except they're not, yes, if they're asking for one, yes. But if you see a, an opening that you think is enticing to you and you are really interested and they ask for resumes, first thing you should actually do is think about, who do I know who works there, who I could go talk to, who, who could I express my passion to? And then get, a, get that, ask that person if you can use their name as you're sending in your cover letter. Or maybe they could put in a good recommendation for you. People 
Every employer has been um, burned in the hiring process. So if you get recommended in by somebody they know, especially somebody that's already in the organization, oh boy, they are going to look at you and you're going to be a top candidate for that job. You know, all that, it's, it's hard, isn't it, to let go of those old rules of how to go job hunting because this is what we've been taught. And what I want to tell you is it's all about relationships. This is what we came to, right? The first question we had, it's all about relationships. It's all about people hire people who are able to do the work that they need. I tell you a story about a lawyer, quick story, because we're running out of time here. But a uh, quick story about a lawyer who um, was laid off from his job. He was like a 50 year associate in an insurance defense firm. And he was so happy when he got laid off because it was miserable. It was not a good fit for him. But what he did was he took time off. Um, he said even getting a transition job, because that's what sometimes people will do in winter. They'll just take a transition job, you know, something temporary, interim, just to bring in some money so that they, it gives them the time to really do the introspection that they need to do. Yeah, so they're not worried. If you're worried about where, where your food's coming from, you're not going to be able to really ask yourself, so oh, what's my passion, right? You've got to be able to meet those basic things first. But taking a transition job, he said, would even distract him from doing the work. So he wanted to really just take some time off. And so his wife, you know, even though they had a house on like Mercer Island and two small kids and his wife didn't work, they figured out a way to, you know, cut back expenses big time. They, um, they, they, uh, she went back to work part time. He took care of the kids. It was all kinds of things like they made arrangements and they were able to give him time off. And during that time, he went on a real ro- roller coaster ride. And, um, but as he started to get to know himself and get to know his passions, it was coming together. And you could tell the energy was coming back. And so he started putting some ideas together and, um, you know, oh, well, let me go explore this path or this path or this. And he had like five different paths that he was, he was um, that his vision statement suggested. And he uh, started going out there and he came back and he said, you know what I want to be for a living? A professional interviewee. I'm having so much fun talking to people, right? But where he got his job was, you know, one of the things he did through that winter was um, go work out every day because he loved working out. And it also got him moving in the morning. And it was a helpful thing for him. It wasn't a, it wasn't a have to kind of thing. Um, so he, he would go do that and, and then try to figure out what to do the rest of the day, right? And, and all during this time, he really didn't talk to anybody at the gym. You know, he was just a loner, you know. But now when he was in spring exploring, this one guy in the, in the locker room said to him, you know, I've been seeing you here for a long time. Um, what's your story? And he was able to tell, express his vision for what he wanted. And, and the guy went, huh, well, isn't that interesting? Because one of the things on his list was labor arbitration and negotiation. And the guy was a, 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 a lawyer for a union. And he said, I'm looking for somebody to hire someone. Now, this client of ours had never worked in labor law before. The closest he got to labor law was two things. A couple of classes in law school, which was six years prior. And why he got fired from the job was he was playing liaison between the secretaries and the assistants and the partners. And the partners didn't like him for it. So he, it came to him naturally. And so he'd never done that work before, but they hired him, and he, he loved it, and it was such a good fit for him. So you never know where you're going to meet people, but you tell everybody that, that vision that you have. And, um, and when you're ready, those opportunities will, will unfold. Yes, we have a question online? We do have a, a question, although we're kind of out of time, but um, very quickly, it's, how would you reassess, how do you reassess that a successful skill set is not something that makes you happy or fulfilled? Where your past or current success does not line up with developing interests, what should be a focus to resolve that conflict? So I, I know we're pretty oh boy, out that's of a time. Long question, I know. The simple answer? Yeah. You sure. check in with yourself. <laughs> if you if if you don't have energy for something, if something is draining you instead of um, and overall, I mean, there's, in every job, there's always those things, right? The few little things that you go, oh, got to do that. Not my favorite thing, but, you know, it's part of, the, part of the deal. But if overall it feels like that, then it's time to step back. Um, 
And we just really need to be able to listen to ourselves. The one thing I, w- I didn't have time for today is the, the center point. Part of um, the cycle is that center point, that place where we have to create time and space to listen. And uh, Joseph Campbell has a great quote about, you know, finding that place every day just to stop, even if it's just for a few minutes, to check in with ourselves um, and to be able to listen on an ongoing basis is really important. So we find our our sources of renewal in lots of different places, big and little ways, right? Sometimes, for me, it's just playing with my cats or gardening or something. For some other people, it might be meditation or, or, or prayer or something like that. Um, Sometimes we need it in a bigger way, taking some, you know, a couple weeks off and going traveling or things. But we just have to create even just a little, little space to be able to say, what do I want and what's important? So um, great questions, great questions. What I'd like to do is end with a quote from Carl Jung. Um, and it's just, it's so interesting um, In the 30s, he was doing all this work around cycles, and this is one of his images from the Red Book. And he says, it all depends on how we look at things and not on how things are in themselves. The least of things with a meaning is worth more in life than the greatest of things without it. The least of things with a meaning. And I think that sort of addresses that last question that we had. It's worth more in life than the greatest of things without it. So uh, just a couple of, um, of more slides. One is just if you want to learn more about Centerpoint, we're at centerpointseattle.org. And uh, we, our mission statement is offering lifelong tools to navigate uncertainty, build meaningful careers, and design courageous lives. Because this is courageous work. And that if you're interested in the book, we've got some out here. Um, it's also on the Seattle, um, this uh, centerpointseattle.org we- website, and it's on Amazon too, so and it's out there uh, if you'd like it. And if you're here and you want me to inscribe it, I'd be happy to. And if you ordered it online, uh, I can inscribe it too before I, we send it off, if you order it through Centerpoint. So different ways to connect with us, the, the website, our email, we're on Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, and on the radio. So once a month, Fourth Tuesday of every month on KKNW, 11.50 a.m. Um, you can also listen online, 11.50 a.m., kknw.com. And uh, the, all the podcasts, though, are on the chatwithwomen.com website. Uh, you can also link to them through Centerpoint. Uh, all different kinds. What we're working through right now is winter stuff. Uh, we started sort of um, fall and letting go, and I have people that I interview. It's an hour-long show, and um, so you might find some of those stories really interesting and people telling them.